Thank you so much, Just. And um, yeah, after getting back from Ukraine, we both had a little bit of the sniffles, and um, I think it was because uh, you know Justin, I slept on his shoulder most of the flight down. He was loving enough to lend me his shoulder as we flew. So good morning, RUC. Um, thank you guys so much for having me. Um, it's so great to see that many of you braved the roads this morning um, for the Discovery 94.7 ride Joburg. And um, you're lucky to have a preacher because as Brett said, I also had to travel from the other side of Blagari and kind of had a bit of a Lord of the Rings moment where I was like Frodo walking down the road at half past six this morning, um, you know, crossing over the dirty Yixke River, the Sprite of Suffering, and, you know, had to dodge the bridge of troll bicycles that were everywhere. And, um, yeah, I got here with a little bit of an Uber help once I got closer to the church, but um, otherwise you wouldn't have had a preacher this morning. Um, I think... Uh, Brett and, and Justin have already kind of introduced me. I'm Ryan Jones, and uh, yeah, I'm on staff here with Mike Phillip. I'm helping out with communications and media because that's kind of the profession that I was in before. My heart is for the people. It's for the gospel. I, I love just seeing the way that the Holy Spirit works in and amongst people, and it is such a great privilege to be able to preach and teach the Word of God. So thank you for having me today. Um, as Justin mentioned, uh, we had the wonderful privilege to go to Ukraine two weeks ago, and it was the first time that I have been out of the country, right? I'd, I'd never been out of the country before, and now Justin was telling me all these horror stories about what happens in overseas and the ablution blocks, and I was freaking out, and um, I ended up taking an, even an extra roll of toilet paper with me in my bag, which everyone laughed at me, and I was like, guys, it's a real thing. I don't know what to expect there. And um, turns out they were all just joking and trying to get me hyped up, and I already suffer from chronic anxiety. Thanks, Justin. But what a great trip it was, and I made sure that I didn't Google anything before I left. I, I didn't, I didn't want to know what was happening in Ukraine. I didn't want to know what the culture was about. I wanted to experience it firsthand without having any presuppositional kind of thoughts as to the people, the culture, and, and I just wanted to soak it all in. I wanted to soak in this people, this place, and this culture, and it ended up being the most humbling and convicting experience of my life. I mean, I've done mission trips in South Africa, little short-term mission trips, but this was just something different, something where you go to a new culture, a new people where you are the minority, and it changed my perspective. You see, Ukraine only got their independence in 1991 from the Soviet Union, and you can definitely see those repercussions in the culture, you can even see it in the people, and you see it in the infrastructure of the buildings. So I wanted to share a couple of, of, of photos with you that, that I had taken over there. So this is the ballet theater that we, we kind of, we went past. And I mean, look how beautiful that architecture is. So you have this place with the most amazing architecture, beautiful statues, and, and some buildings even have these gargoyles and lion heads coming off the top of it. It's, it's immaculate. If you go to the next slide, I mean, look at that. I, I don't even know what building that was. I, I don't know if Just knows what it was, but that was a building just coming from the airport, and I was just sitting in the car taking it all in. I'm just snapping away, and I mean, look how beautiful that, that building is in Ukraine. But the thing is, is that that is just the good side of it, because this is just a couple of blocks, not even a couple of blocks, maybe a block away from where we were staying, and 90% of Ukraine, well, Odessa, looks like this, and not that there's anything wrong with it, but if you're a Joburg boy or girl that has been brought up here your whole life like myself, this looks like Hillbrow. This looks like a place that I served in, in Berea. You know, this, this is something where it's run down and, and, and you can see this kind of, not real gap of poverty, but you can see how communism in the Soviet Union had the impact that it had on the society. We then came to this Orthodox Church in downtown, and, and, and we, we walked inside, and it had also the most amazing kind of artwork and design. If you just go to the next slide. I mean, this is the, this is the inside of the, the Orthodox Church there. And at first, I kind of had my hand in my pocket, and I was kind of holding my cell phone, and I was like, I don't know if we can take photos in here or not, you know, like, is it allowed, is it not allowed? The last thing I want is to be arrested, and I really had freaking out about passport control, and uh, you know, it was like, I don't know, you know when you see the police, you haven't done anything wrong, but you feel guilty anyways, it was kind of like that feeling. And I'm like, 
okay, well, I don't want to like, you know, be deported. I've only been here for like five hours. Um, <clears throat> but people were taking photos, so I thought, okay, well, I'm going to do this. So I start snapping away, and that was one of the first photos that I'd taken. But, but you'll see this beautiful kind of pathway and these pillars and... And I was in awe, I was looking at the roof and just the amazing paintings and artwork. And, but my eye was caught to the side as I looked and there was this old babushka, this old granny. And there's these two little steps that go up by the column and there's this painting. And before the painting, as you stand on the stairs, there's a cabinet of some kind and a piece of glass and there's something underneath the cabinet. I'm not even actually sure what it was, but this lady is huddled over this cabinet with her face prostrate just on there, just on, flat on the glass, kissing the glass, praying something or saying something that, I, I mean, I couldn't make out what she was saying, and even if I could, it's in Russian, so it wouldn't be helpful to me, but she was bereaved. She was, I'd never seen so much emotion as this person huddled over a cabinet before a painting, and I admit wholeheartedly that I don't know what her heart where her heart is, and, and I'm not here to judge, and I wasn't judging her. I don't know where she stands with God. I'm not the judge of that. But my heart went out to her when I saw just how much pain and anguish, whatever she was going through, her whole heart, her whole body was in this thing. And I was just moved to tears. I, I looked at Justin, and, I, and I, tears were welling up in my eyes because my heart felt broken because I didn't know what she was putting her hope in. Was she putting her hope in this painting of the saint that was before her? Or was she putting her hope in Jesus Christ? And I don't know that answer, but my heart felt this tension. This tension. You see, because a place that has so much beauty, all these paintings, all this gold ornament, fittings everywhere, means nothing it means nothing if we, you and I are focused on the wrong things. And that was the harsh reality that kind of hit me like a ton of bricks, a reality that maybe people try and hold onto something to give them purpose, something to give them purpose, something that will hear our cries and bring us hope other than God. You know, we have people in our lives here in Joburg, perhaps in your family, in your friend group, or just as you look around and live life in Joburg, people that look like they have it all together. They look like they have everything together, but they seek and fulfillment, seek fulfillment in worldly things. Things like that church looks so pretty, that looks so pretty and they're wrapped up in gold, like that painting, but then we place our hope in dead things that have no ears to hear. They have no ears to hear, no heart to care, and no power to change the circumstances that we find ourselves in. And I wanted to share that with you this morning because we see Jesus walking into the religious buildings of his day, the synagogues of many towns and villages as he preached the good news of the coming of the kingdom of God. The scripture of Matthew 9, 35 to 38 gives us this beautiful window. It gives us this beautiful window into the heart of God as he looked at the people around him. And this is where we will be camping today. In Matthew 9, 35 to 38. Because here we see just, not just what Jesus thought and what he did, but what he felt how he felt about mankind as he watched them worship things around them that would never give them any true purpose, identity, or peace for their souls. So Matthew 9, 35 to 38 says this. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest therefore 
to send out workers into his harvest field. You see, in verse 35, he went to all the cities and villages, teaching and preaching that the kingdom was at hand. He was teaching that people need to repent and turn away from their sin, but why? But why? In verse 36, we, we see an answer, because it says, when he saw these crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. He had compassion for them, a deep love that was felt to the very core of his soul. Now the English language is a strange language in that there are many words that you and I use that have kind of become meaningless over the years. We we can't really describe things as well as some of the other languages such as Greek and Hebrew and In the Greek, the word of the original text, the translation is splachnizome. So that word for compassion in the Greek is splachnizome, and that's how it is spelt. And this word is a deep feeling that is felt within the bowels of a person. Now that is a a terrible description, but it is in the bowels, it's deep within the pit of your stomach that you feel moved for somebody. Have you ever felt that way about anybody? Have you ever been in a place of suffering or loss for someone else that you feel this deep compassion that is in the, not just in your heart, but in your very soul, in your very belly? I'd like to share a story with you about my life. And three years ago, my dad passed away from pancreatic cancer. And I remember it so well that it was a few days before Father's Day and mom phones me and says, listen, dad hasn't been eating for like the last two days and he's just been throwing up. And and I immediately just started getting irritated and angry because I know that he's obviously been stubborn and doesn't want to go to the hospital. And I'm like, obviously he hasn't gone to the hospital, why? No, he says he'll be okay. No, I'm coming over right now So you better be ready by the time I get to the house and I'm gonna pick you guys up and I'm gonna take you to the hospital. So we go to Santon Medi Clinic and he gets these scans done and they're pumping his stomach and these lovely things and they find a mass in his colon but they're not quite sure what it is. At first they thought it was just a calcium buildup but the radiologist couldn't really tell us what it is so we ended up having to move him and transfer him to the Donald Gordon Clinic near Witz so that a specialist can have a look. So the the specialist surgeon and the radiologist sit now with these x-rays and with these results and they go, okay, listen, well, we still can't tell what it is. The only way we can do that is by operating. So a couple of days later, my dad goes into theater and The the operation was only supposed to take about an hour and a half because they were gonna do a gastric bypass. You know, she said, okay, it's just gonna be simple. That build up, whatever it is, we're just gonna cut one side, cut the other side, remove it, and put it together. It's like Tetris. So we're gonna just do that, and then, you know, he should be fine. But an hour goes by, no news from the doctor. Two hours go by, no news from the doctor. Three hours go by, and eventually the doctor comes in. And she says to us, listen, I couldn't even do the bypass. There's just so many nodules and nodes all over his intestines that if I had to remove anything, I'd have to remove all of his intestines, which is impossible. And even if I could, your body would never be able to survive the shock of going through that. The little nodes were everywhere in his abdomen and even on his liver and kidneys. And that began the journey of the next three months before he passed away. And I remember about a week before he passed, I don't even know if it was a week because time just feels like it doesn't exist when you're going through something like that. And I remember the one day after finishing work, I drove through to the Donald Gordon and he was in the high care unit in the oncology ward. And I walked in and 
He was a hollow of a man, a skeleton. And I looked at his face, which was just sunken in, you know, the bones sunken in, and his eyes were glossed over, and he was just staring into space. And when I saw him like that, I just turned out of the room and, and walked away, and I just burst into tears, and I just said, I can't do this anymore. I just thought, I can't do this anymore, and every bit of my body was in pain, and I felt the sadness deep within the pit of my stomach. I'd never ever felt a sadness like that before. It was so deep. In, it was not, I, I wasn't nauseous, but it felt like I almost was going to be. It was so deep in my stomach. And for me, when Jesus talks about this compassion that he had felt, the sadness that he felt when he, he looked upon those who are harassed and helpless, I can picture that feeling. I can picture that feeling that I felt when I wanted to take the place of my father in that hospital bed but had no power to do so. Jesus feels this way about the crowds before him. Because he looked at them, these helpless and harassed sheep without a shepherd. But why were they harassed and helpless? What reason? Well remember, these are God's people He loves them, and they, like us, live in a broken world where sickness and poverty, oppression from from Rome at the time, false religiosity in their spiritual shepherds, so the religious leaders of their day were leading them astray into legalism. God looks on them all with the same level of compassion. No matter who they are and what they have. Because it's not about power or prestige or pedigree. Because at the end of the day, the high priest that was there, the successful business owner, and the homeless beggar would all meet at the same synagogue to praise the same God. They all had one thing in common with each other, as well with us, is that they had separation from God. We know in the beginning of Genesis, we we have the story of Adam and Eve and that they were tempted by the evil one into seeking equality with God. That's what they wanted. They no longer wanted to obey God and the privileges and the grace that he afforded them. No, they wanted to be the captains of their own ship and the masters of their own destinies. So they disobeyed God. But where the disobedience was, punishment was due. And the curse of sin was death. A spiritual death that separated God's creation from himself. For if a holy God is holy, he can't take the bad things we do and wipe it under a rug and go, don't worry about it. Because then he would cease to be good. So he needs to do something. There needs to be some form of justice. But since that day, we have walked the earth, human beings like sheep with a massive God-shaped hole in us. But for God, because he looked down upon us and had mercy on us, the compassion that he had moved him to not only feel for us, but actually take our place like I looked at my father and hoped that I could exchange the pain and suffering that he was going through. Jesus looked on us. God looked on us and he said, I wanna take away their pain and suffering. I will exchange places with them. So God sent his only son, the scripture tells us, to enter this messy and broken world, to live a life of obedience to God the Father that you and I could never live. You and I could never live it. And then he died a death that you and I deserve by taking our place and carrying our sins and transgressions upon his own shoulders. And that was the great exchange that happened on the cross of Calvary. Isaiah 53, four to six says this. It says, surely he took up our pain 
and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned our own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He has compassion for us in the same way as that he had compassion on those crowds as he walked into those synagogues. Because sheep, all sheep, cannot lead themselves. A sheep is oblivious to the dangers around it. It doesn't know what dangers lurk around the next corner. And there's that anecdote of the frog in the boiling water. I'm sure many of you have heard of it. You know, if you, if you have this boiling water and you throw a frog into it, it will hop out. It immediately knows that there's something wrong, that this is dangerous. But if you take a pot of cold water, the fable says that if you start heating it slowly and you place that frog in there while the water is still cold, it will heat up and heat up 20 degrees, this frog won't move. 40 degrees, the frog won't move. 70 degrees, the frog won't move. Even when it reaches 100 degrees, the frog will sit in that boiling water. And like that frog, we become numb to the things around us. And all of mankind is in that same boat, harassed and helpless. And the thing is, is that we then treat the symptoms and not the disease. Because as I mentioned before, that God-shaped hole in us is always empty. We just try and fill it up with things around us, whether that be religiosity, whether that be relationships, whether that be moralism and just being a good person, or maybe it's even materialism. All of these short-term things make us feel a little bit better about our lives, about our suffering, about what we lack, about our identity. For a short while, we feel like we've made it. We feel we've placed a band-aid over that hole. But it doesn't take us long before that void starts opening up again and we look to the next best thing to bring us that feeling of peace or just make us numb enough that we can forget about our problems for the day. As Jesus moved through the crowd, he then does something quite incredible. He does something quite incredible. So he sees this, these people as I looked just in that, in that church when I saw this granny that was in pain and in suffering, just pleading before this painting. There's this group of people here that he sees. He sees this lost group of people. But then Jesus turns. He turns to his disciples. And now a distinction is made between those who are harassed and helpless and these men who are on his side who know the shepherd. Ones who have followed and are following the shepherd, who have received and recognized Jesus for who and for what he came to do. He turns to them and gives them instruction pertaining to these harassed and helpless people. They are not merely receivers, but they are partakers in God's plan. They are the partakers. So in verse 37, he then says to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into this harvest. He shifts this metaphor from flock of sheep to a field and a harvest. These people are likened to a harvest and the workers are the ones who are few. At this stage, we know that the disciples are but a small number in comparison to the massive world. Even today, we look at this massive world of people who do not know the gospel of Jesus Christ. This harvest are the unreached peoples who do not know the gospel of Jesus. But you see, the problem is not with the harvest. When Jesus turns to the disciples, the problem is not with the harvest because there will always be people ready to receive the word of God. 
And that is why Jesus says to them, the first thing you do, not here's a list of 10 things that you guys must go do right now. The first thing he says to them is pray. The first thing. As human beings, we love the checklist because at least it gives us a purpose, it gives us a drive, it gives us a direction, and that, that's not bad things, but the Lord is saying, no, 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 I do the work. I do the work. You need to pray first. You need to pray for the Lord of the harvest to do that work. The world needs more disciples who know the shepherd to go out and share the good news. You cannot share something that you, you do not, yourself do not have. But the disciples' role was not merely just to pray because we know a little later in Matthew 10, Jesus sends the disciples to go out and minister to the people. He then sends them. He says, go rather to the lost sheep of Israel and as you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. But then here's the crux, he says, freely you have received, freely give. Freely you have received, now freely give. I feel like in today's modern Christian culture we have misdiagnosed the problem because we feel maybe or maybe I speak for myself here, that the problem is the harvest. The problem is the people that we're trying to reach. The sad reality is, is that many, many professing Christians have never shared the gospel with anybody. The problem is with us because we come to church day in and day out, week in and week out. We declare that Jesus is Lord, but yet we have no burden for the lost knowing full well that once we ourselves were lost, and this is so convicting for me when I think about my life, how I don't deserve the grace of God, how I never deserved for him to come down into my life and show me who he is. And it challenges me to go, how many people in my life have I shared the gospel with? If Jesus' heart is full of compassion and he came to save us, who did not deserve it. Freely we have received the grace of the gospel. It is free, but it was not cheap. How can we look at those around us and not feel moved to likewise freely extend and share Christ's love and gospel to them? So my prayer for us today is that we would be the answer to our own prayers. So that very prayer to ask the Lord to send out more laborers into the harvest, we must pray that. But I feel so guilty because I feel like I sit and pray that and the Lord's going, well, what's wrong with your hands? I gave you a heart, a new one. I've given you two feet and two hands and even though you had half a brain, I've given you a little bit more. Use it, use it for my glory. So would we not only just pray that the Lord would send more workers, but I implore all of us, myself included, the chief of sinners, that we would be the answer. Would we pray to the Lord, Lord, I don't know if I even really thought about this. Life has been so busy, the season has been so busy, 2019 has been hard, my family has suffered, I've been under tension and financial struggle or sickness or illness or just relationship issues. I, I don't know if I can do this. But I know that when I've just focused on my own problems personally, it has stopped me from loving people around me. But when I focus on others' problems, it helps me to realize that maybe sometimes my problems are not that bad. And it gives me, instead of a heart of anguish and depression, it gives me a heart of thanksgiving. December is just around the corner, and the shops have already started with the Boney M. It's the worst. And the fruitcake has been put out, it's the worst. I don't know who eats fruitcake, but I just hope at the year end staff function we're not going to have fruitcake, Justin. Please don't, let's not have fruitcake. 
We can have fruit and we can have cake, but not together. <laughs> Michael Bublé is climbing out of his cave as we speak, and he is ready to grace my home with his lovely voice of Christmasness. It's a festive and wonderful time where people that don't necessarily know who Jesus is have this festivity about them. The shops have this festivity about them. And despite all the commercialism and materialism and gifts and things that might sway us, there's something so great that we get to spend time with people that we don't see the whole year or at all. And I want you to think about those who will be around your Christmas table this year, around the Care December holiday brides, at the prize giving or the graduation, and at that Staff India function. As Brett mentioned earlier in one of the announcements, he said that we have this Christmas carol service on the 1st of December. Invite somebody, invite anyone, invite everyone. Don't take it for granted because the sad reality is is that some of us will have an empty seat at the Christmas table this year. It's part of life. This will be my family's third year with that empty seat at the table. It'll be the third year where I won't have my dad running around in his boxes and a Christmas hat, which is incredibly embarrassing. And it's funny now, you kind of miss that. But at the time, you don't want to miss, no one should have to see that. <laughs> Especially the visitors that come to the house. That's how I know he was an introvert, under the shadows, because he would just dress in these boxes, and people would be like, oh, thanks for having me. <laughs> but there's three years that I had where I have no regret, because my father knew Jesus and not because I saved him. Jesus alone can do that. We can't change anyone. You cannot save anyone. They have to make that decision themselves. And not everyone will respond to the gospel. But I hope this year that you would be brave enough, I hope that I would be brave enough to sit around the table with family, friends, non-Christians, Christians, and have no regrets because I'd shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. Charles Spurgeon, a very famous theologian and one of the greatest preachers that walked this earth, he said this, he said, if sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our dead bodies. And if they perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped about their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions and let no one go unwarned and unprayed for. If you are wrestling with what you believe today, if you are part of that crowd that Jesus looked upon where you don't know why you're here, It's not by chance that you are, but trying to figure things out, you're trying to figure out, is this Jesus thing real? Is Christianity real? God has brought you here, and what an amazing privilege it is for us to host you this morning. And If you feel like you are harassed and helpless, then then we would love to pray for you. If you don't know the shepherd, we would love to lead you to him. We would love to answer your questions to walk a journey with you. This is not blind faith that we have here. It is faith with purpose and meaning and truth. So you can come and chat to me after the service or we'll have our prayer team up here that would love to to pray and chat with you. Otherwise, you can please get hold of the church in the week. And if you know the shepherd and you're sitting here this morning, if you know the shepherd, I implore you as as I felt convicted when I was preparing this message. I don't want guilt upon us, and the Lord doesn't either. It is just so beautiful to see Jesus Christ, and when I look upon him, 
I think to myself, why don't I love people like he loves me? And maybe that's your prayer this morning, Lord, help me to love people, because people are hard to love. Would we have the strength to do that? And if you are struggling with something in your life, we all go through seasons, none of us are perfect. Jesus alone is perfect. But we would again, would love to help you and walk a journey with you. And the team will be up here for you as well, so may the Lord give us grace and strength to do his work because he is, he is coming back. And it's not all over. As Ravi Zacharias says, a Christian apologist, he says, to the world, the end of life is a full stop. But the gospel of Jesus Christ takes that little full stop and makes a comma. Because only now is the beginning of all things. And he is making all things new. Let us pray. Father God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for our brothers and sisters in the room. Thank you, Lord, that your Holy Spirit alone can change us and move in us. Father, thank you for the compassion that you give us. And thank you for the compassion that you've had on us. No matter where we are at, Lord, we can come to you as we are in our brokenness, in our sin, in our struggles in the things that we did last night, in the things we've done this week, that you are merciful, and every day is a day of repentance and mercy, that we are not beyond your love and beyond your grace, that your death on that cross was free, that we can receive it, but it was not cheap. Would you open our hearts, Lord, that for those of us who need a reminder of that this morning, And for those of us who have heard it maybe for the first time or only understand it for the first time because of the power of your spirit, Lord, I pray that that you would change our hearts, take away our hearts of stone and give us hearts that are beating, hearts of flesh. So as we go out into this day, as we go and love on people around us as the Christmas season draws close, would you help us to love people, Lord Jesus? Help us to remember that we were once lost We were not worthy, but yet you found us, that you saved us. And for those riding the race today, Lord, we pray for protection over them. We pray, Father, for the rest of this day that it would inspire us and that we can serve you. All the glory and the honor and praise be to your holy name. Amen.